recording this uh, this webinar right now, and I'm going to introduce Jim, and we're going to kick this off right on time. I want to be cognizant of everybody's schedule. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through um, Jim Construction. Jim from Power Construction is, is with us, and we're going to walk through Jim's workflow and some of the uh, challenges that they faced in terms of onboarding. And once they got through some of those, how did this, uh, you know, how did they roll this out, and what processes did this replace for them? and what efficiency they saw. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to open that up to Jim, and, and then we're going to leave the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So everybody, please hang on the line, and uh, we can pepper Jim with some questions or pepper myself with a couple questions. So uh, looking forward to this, and thanks again for everybody joining. Uh, Jim, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Um, and I want to thank everybody for taking uh, time out of your busy day to, uh, to go through this. I think you're going to find some of the stuff uh, enlightening. Um, and what we wanted to do is showcase a lot of the a lot of the workflows and processes that we've learned over the past over the past year using the software. And um, again, like Mark said, uh, we want to open this up to questions uh, at the end. Um, and if you want to stick around at the very end, there's another uh, video which you can either watch on YouTube or you can watch the video of some of the stuff that we're going to go through and kind of. Um, um, kind of summarize everything we went on with today. So I'm going to get this started. Um, let's see, page down. Let's see. If I can, one second. Okay, a little bit of an introduction. Um, so similar to a lot of you that are on the uh, seminar today, um, a lot of my peers and colleagues um, have been, uh, been in the industry now for quite some time. It's going on about 20 years. Um, and uh, I'm currently the uh, VDC director here at Power, so we get to see a lot of the, the cutting-edge technology that is going on in the industry, um, but I've also seen it from other sides of the fence, so I have a unique opportunity where I've seen it from both a uh, designer's perspective, a sub's perspective, and now the GC perspective uh, for the past uh, 10 years now. So. Um, I think I can give you a little bit of insight, and I wanted to show you some of the things that uh, that we uh, we've learned, and uh, we'll go through that uh, uh, next with the agenda. So, first of all, why why do we want to implement this? So, there's a lot of reasons why, but uh, I want to focus on a couple of key things that we all struggle with um, from both a uh, coordination and communication aspect in the world of uh, building information modeling. And then we're going to go through um, some of the workflows that we were currently had in place before we started this process, and then some of the new processes that we've, uh, that we've implemented, uh, like Marcus said, and, and how things have changed um, using this process and some of the things we've learned. And again, I'm, again I want to open this up to the, uh, to the team when this is all said and done, and not only focus on things that we've learned that have been extremely exciting and beneficial, but focus, you know, we'll, let's be honest about this. Let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of the pitfalls that we've, that we've incurred. So maybe you can learn from some of the things that we've had to work through. And then again, we'll open up to questions. I'll show you a quick video of some of the stuff that uh, was released a couple months ago. Um, the, the team, the team at Revisco has been awesome. They, they in fact, they're sometimes they're too good. They, uh, you'll get an update for the software like every week or every two weeks, um, and you want to keep up with the updates because uh, we can talk about some of those things when we talk about some of the challenges that we're going to talk about today. Um, but they're always on the, on the forefront and cutting edge with a lot of the technology. So let, let's get this thing started. So the first question that I, that I always focused is why. So, you know, we see a lot of cool, exciting stuff that's out there, but what is the big question and what is this going to do for me? What is going to be the benefit? Because if it's not going to benefit my team or anybody that I'm involved with on via coordination, via site logistics, what have you, then it doesn't make any sense to me. So the first question I asked was, okay, what is this going to do? We're already using Navisworks. Um, it works great. Um, you know, we have some struggles, but uh, it, it was it was working just fine. And, and actually, after taking a step back and really diving into this about a year ago, I was like, man, I was so wrong. When I first got started with this application, you know, I, I thought it was just another add-on. It was something like you would use for some of the other programs out there without naming names that we could take it out to the field. It, was, it would work for mobility and it had all these other features. 
and I was it was eye opening. It's it's nothing like that. What it is to me now now that I'm stepping back and looking at the looking at the forest from outside um, and actually seeing all the trees, I'm I'm realizing that this is more of like the paradigm switch when we went from like AutoCAD to Revit. I mean, it was completely eye opening. We were getting, all of a sudden, we're getting benefits, and everybody's talking, and we're communicating everything that we that we preach and we sell, uh, and 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 in presentations was actually working now. So I want to want to kind of go through some of the things that we've learned. So first question is to ponder is, and, and again, why some these are some of the things that we've we've seen, you know, in the past, you know, I want to say, you know, 10, 12 years doing coordination. Some of the things that always come up in a coordination meeting. So we create clashes and viewpoints, we assign them, but how do you know work is getting done? How many times are you sitting there doing something as a coordinator or a sub, you know, doing the modeling, and you're expecting somebody else to get the work done? How do you know it's getting done? You really don't. I mean, you can go up there, you can download the latest files from, you know, from your FTP site or your box account, what have you, and download those and see what's happening. But Really, you really don't know what's happening. And a lot of times, one of the things I focus on when we do kickoffs is I ask everybody, hey, you need to post your work regularly. But how many times does that actually happen? And without having some sort of way to log that, you really don't know. Um, how do I find, you know, when you're, when you're in a coordination meeting and you're addressing all these issues, always I get this question, where are you at now? You know, I, I, I can't follow you because well, you're, you're flying through this massive model and you have all these viewpoints that you're identifying. And the from a sub's perspective, it's kind of mind-boggling because what you're doing is you're witnessing somebody make a viewpoint. You're trying to track, track where he's going next. And then all you can do is, you know, after a while, you just kind of kind of be like, well, I'll just download the NWD and I'll look at it and I'll get to uh, fixing that issue. But how do you really know where that's at? We're going to show you, you know, that with the the coordinate features that we have right now with this software that you can do that. You know, what happens after, you know, changes that happen after coordination is done. Um, a lot of times we're getting model updates and we've already signed off on a floor. And I can't tell you how many times you go in there and again, with a typical process, we're making viewpoints, we're going back, we're hoping that everything is getting taken care of. But again, we don't know, we flip through all the viewpoints, we make a log file just like everybody does. And then you hope for the best and you get to the field and you, you see what's happening. But what happens if something happens after you've already had that coordination? Well, a lot of times you're sending an email, doing a screenshot, saying, hey, you've got to fix this. This is something that happened. we got a new revision of documents. We're not going to go back and look at this again. But please take care of this. So right now, what we were doing before we had this process is we were doing the same, make a viewpoint, hoping it was going to be taken care of. Um, we're going to show you how that's different. Um, let's see. You know, and again, what happens if something isn't picked up? Where's your log file? You know, down the road, I can't, in the past, what, what happens is we'll finish coordination and I'll get this random phone call about six to eight months after we're done with coordination. And it's one of the, you know, and we're, we're typically all, everybody knows everybody, it's a pretty tight community when we're doing coordination. And so-and-so calls and says, hey, do you remember this issue that we had with this? Can you give me, do you have emails or you have correspondence on what we did there? Because, you know, whatever happened, it didn't get picked up. And now it's a real issue in the field. How do you go back and track that without spending hours of time looking for emails and correspondence? How do you handle that? It was always an issue. Um, luckily, if you had been doing this for a while, again, you were pretty detailed in your note-taking with Navisworks. Um, but there's a better way to do that now. How about the fact that during coordination, what we're going to talk about, a lot of times what we'll do is after coordination, instead of running reports anymore, we're always posting an NWD file to the, to, the account, to the cloud account or wherever it's at, asking our sub, our sub partners to download and look at that. But what happens? The information is instantly static and old within hours of it's done. Half the time, a lot of my top tier subs, when they're going up there, they're making changes during the coordination meeting. And hours after that's done, they have an updated file. Well, the NWD is outdated. And again, how do you know if something's been corrected? You really don't know without having some sort of log. And these are just some of the things that we've noticed. And again, the RFI question, a lot of times we'll be in coordination and somebody will, be, or somebody will say, hey, I have an RFI on that question. Well, how do you know that? How do you, how do you track certain things uh, when it comes to that? So what I want to do next is flip over to a typical, typical project. And this is 
what I have here is this is an MWD. This is a um, this is a file that we were working on recently. Um, it was a it was a project that had been going on for months. And what we did, as you can see, and I'm going to minimize my screen one second if I can get rid of that. Can't see my log. One second. And I apologize. And if I'm talking too loud, please let me know. Or talking too fast, please let me know. Because um, raise your hand, send me a chat message. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes I get a little too excited about this. So this is an this is a Navisworks file. And this is something that we this was an NWD um, from a coordination session. And as you can see on here, this was one of the sessions. We had all these clashes that were in here. As a subcontract, you can see. I have everything we've tried to pretty much identify it by trade, by look, you know, by trade, by level, etc. Giving direction on what to do with comments and the viewpoints, um, and we go through and we track all this stuff and we post an NWD. Well, as you can see, it can be kind of overwhelming, um, and to a lot of times in a, in a project like this, there are time constraints between meetings are anywhere from two two days to a week and we're expecting all the stuff to get done and then what happens you come to the next meeting um, you run your class report again or you run your class detection again you make new viewpoints and what happens you're looking at the same issues over half the time over and over and you don't you know you're you're asking yourself well what you know are they really working on my project is things really getting done and really you can you can you can at that point you can export like an XML file. You can write logs. You can do all this stuff. But really, if you're if I'm thinking holistically, before we started with the with our new process, it was really cumbersome. I mean, there's no real way for me as a subcontractor to filter what issues are mine. I can add comments and stuff like we in in Navisworks we have the ability to add comments. Um, add fill, add um, fields so we can try to find and filter things, but it really, really wasn't easy to do. So my question was, was there a better way? And this is what would happen in our meetings. So um, we had a we had a our weekly coordination meeting. We would post an NWD. Again, we looked at all those viewpoints. Everybody would download the same NWD file. Our next scheduled meeting, they would upload their files. We would hope that they had their issues done. You know, some of the issues were corrected. Some of the issues couldn't be corrected. So what would happen in the meetings, it would bounce back at the very next meeting. It wasn't like, you know, we're all creatures of habit. You know, when, when, we, when we look at an NWD, it was, again, it was a static model. We, a lot of times we're so busy with everything else that's going on just to make those changes that typically we don't send emails, or if we do send emails, it takes time, and we have to screenshot it and send it back. We ask additional RFIs and questions at the very next meeting, and what happens? Your coordination process gets drugged out over and over and over again. We typically said that on a typical project, it would take typically three to four meetings to get through a floor. And sometimes if it was really intense, those three to four meetings would end up being six to eight, because Again, we would ask people to coordinate and push their files out there on a daily basis, but with everything going on in everybody's life, a lot of times it was too hard to pick up the phone or send an email, um, and we would resolve the things at the next coordination meeting. And this is, again, what, what we would typically do. This is just another way to look at it. Again, we would run, as a general contractor, we would run the clashes. We would make viewpoints. If we had an issue, we would attach a, a, a screenshot to the email. But the issues really weren't attended to basically until the very next coordination meeting. It was kind of, again, it was static. It wasn't live. It wasn't a whole lot going on. And again, from time to time, if you had really good teams, a lot of our teams were really good, and I've been working with a lot of you for a long time. You're awesome. Um, but uh, we, some, some teams were better than others, and you know, some we just have a lot of, a lot of times it was, it was kind of hard to get up to speed with some of the projects that we had because they were so intense. So that was that, and this is kind of what happened at the end of the meeting. Again, you would make all these viewpoints. Everybody thought they were going in the same direction, but as you can see on the screen here, as a coordinator, I thought, oh, I made all my viewpoints. This is awesome. And then the subcontractor would be thinking down, you know, thinking in the back of his head, well, I think I got the direction here. Somebody else is thinking he's got this direction here. 
the design team saying it's awesome, everybody's on the same page, but in reality, nobody's really communicating and there was nothing really, you know, everybody was working in a vacuum to get their issues done and you hope that everything worked out, but what if they didn't? Well, that's why the meetings would drag on and on and on and you're constantly trying to chase the stick and everything is supposed to be working uniformly in the same portion, in the same format. And that, you, there just had to be a better way, right? Um, and from my opinion, and this is, this is not, this is just my opinion, this doesn't mean that this is the, this is true for everybody, but I think Revisto has solved like a lot of my major issues. And I want to go through some of those, those things that we talked about and touched on already now. And I think this is, this was like a game changer for us. And I'll, I'll go through the metrics at the end, but just some of the things that we've learned doing this process. So how does it start? But really, um, instead of making what it really is, it, the base, the base board or the baseline for all this information and all these changes that we have going on is really the issue tracker. And the issue tracker is like the common speak between all the applications that we're doing in coordination for either, you know, actually 3D coordination, or if you think about it, if you're doing design reviews, some of our design teams are doing this, great. We can actually, you know, if we're, if we're designing something, we have this common platform where we're now basically, what we're doing is we're embedding an email on top of a model, on top of a live updated platform, so that anytime changes are made, you can, you can reassign them to somebody else. And what I'll do is I'll just open this up right now so you can see how that looks. And then I'll show you some of the key features. So again, I got to move this over. You guys can't see this, but I'm going to move this. Oh, there we go. I can do that. All right, I got this minimized now. Hold, hold for a second here. So this is the issue tracker. And, how, and, uh, and I'll show you how we create some of these issues. And maybe I should, I can, um, maybe I should do that first. Um, what I'll do is I'll go into another live project here. And what's different from making viewpoints, and uh, bear with me if I'm driving a little too fast or if there's a little bit of a lag. The way this works is the issue tracker uh, is installed across all your applications uh, as long as you had closed your applications before you ran the install. And we typically we tell people instructions on how to do this. But what you'll see on here is in, on the right-hand side, that's my typical viewpoints. We are no longer really making viewpoints in our coordination meetings. Instead of, instead of making viewpoints, what we're doing is we're tracking issues. So what we would do is we'd go through and we would run our clash detective, uh, our clash detection over here. Um, look at these. We, you know, sometimes we would look at something like this, and we would we would typically make viewpoints. But now with the new process, with tracking the issues, it's it's really quite simple. The only change that we do during coordination from a GC's perspective is on the tab, and this is on all your tabs again, whether it's Revit, AutoCAD, Navisworks, SketchUp, ArchiCAD. Um, there will be a little plug-in as long as you install the right application to install the Revisto, the Revisto 4 um, application right there on the ribbon. And you'll, what you want to do when you get started, and this was kind of a, a lessons learned for us when we first got started, is we were actually making issues, but we didn't have that dynamic, dy, dynam, dynamic link between the program and the actual software. And what you really want to do is launch, the, launch your project and then launch the issue tracker from this point. So again, instead of making viewpoints, now what we'll do is we'll go through there, we'll run our clashes, we'll come in here, and let's just see if I can, um, I can highlight something real quick. And I'll make a dynamic link for you. So we make a new issue. Uh, let's go back. I made a big, whoops, new issue. Okay, here we are. So we make a new issue, we give it a title, give it a test. Um, we do our typical markups, and the markup tools have been extremely enhanced over the last uh, year we can now there's like now there's a sketch icon which I think is phenomenal because I sketch everything from an architectural standpoint put in a note here this is this is a test done now that's done hit there and now this is where the difference comes in and then this is one thing that I think everybody should be doing is now this is the issue that I've taken from my Navis model and it's now in the actual common speak, common platform, issue tracker, slash Revisto program itself. Um, the first thing I'll do when I make an issue is I'll add a tag. 
And the reason I add tags is, and this is something that you, so what makes this process different than making viewpoints, when we make viewpoints, we would just give it a title and a name and try to organize that and put it in folders by the date or by the level or however you want to do that. But it really wasn't searchable. It really, really couldn't find things really fast. That's the purpose of a tag. So in here, if I want to do something for, so I did this for one of the classes I was teaching, just label this class exercise. Uh, maybe this is level one and hit done. And why is that important? From a SUDS perspective, you have all these issues that are in your log. I don't really care about all those issues. As you can see, I'm still getting live updates on this, and that's what the little green icon here symbolizes on the screen. I'm constantly getting live updates from my entire team throughout the day, and that's, that's how I can tell from a coordinator what is getting worked up. But from a subs perspective, if I want to look at my issues, what I can do is I can filter it by my name, which is who they sign, who's been assigned the class. So if I want to look at, let's say that something's been assigned to me, I can filter these and these can come up, you can filter by assignee, name, or whatever, you can clear that, or if I come up here, I can filter it by tag, and this is why we add tags to everything now. If I want to filter it for just that classroom exercise, I can quickly zoom in. I no longer have to go through this mess, which is over here. If you can see on the right-hand side, these are all the issues. Again, from a subs perspective, all I care about is what, is, what do I have to fix so I am most efficient with my time and I can, I can, I can really get to the issue at hand? But, and, and, and that's why we use tags for everything. So um, we, can, we typically will tag, the tags that we're doing for practice right now is um, we're tagging levels. We're tagging um, uh, by trade. So instead of just assignee, we actually will assign, you know, HVAC water, um, sanitary, if there's a specific system on this job, we'll do, um, you can see on here, there's pool. I've got RFIs as a tag. If I want to quickly come in here and see what I have RFIs generated on this project, I can come in here and filter it by RFIs that are outstanding. Um, it's just a really great medium that we, that, we, that we have to, again, streamline and find the issues that we are doing during coordination. Some of the other things that we've started as a process from our end, and this has been awesome, has been, you know, a lot of times, and also with this issue tracker, what we have in the center here, if you haven't seen this and you haven't used this software already, this has been so key. Let me just go down here and get some of the older original issues because um, some of these are quite good. Um, this right here was our initial issue. And again, you can see here it keeps a log of everything that has happened with that particular clash that we saw. And this is another key benefit. You see on the screen here how we have the actual issue is identified and it's color-coded, similar to what you would see if you were running clash detection inside Navisworks. The difference that you have with something like that versus just an NWD, if I go to some of these clashes in here, as a subcontractor, when I first got started, one of the pains that I had was the fact that I can't afford a $10,000 application from Navisworks Manage. I can't do clash detection. And even if I could, half the time, you know, a lot of the subs are not, or a lot of our partners, I should say, are not running clash detection outside the meeting. So they're looking at these models with, you know, unique colors that we're hoping to identify. But sometimes the colors are so close together, you really can't identify them. The awesomeness with some of these just subtle changes is the fact that if you're running clash detection, if you take the dim off, it still highlights the clash and identifies it on the screen so they know exactly where it is. So that's, they, they know exactly where to look when they're looking at this and what they're looking at. And then what we typically ask our subs or our, our partners to do is if something's done from a, co from a coordinator's perspective is we say, okay, you can come in there then and then mark the status from open to solved so that we know that it's done. Or you can mark it in progress so we know that you're working on it. We give them the rights to do that. And then when something is solved, we ask them to paste a screenshot of the resolution right here. So why that's so helpful is when I'm coming through and I'm looking at this on a daily basis. And that is the other thing that's totally different is from a coordinator's perspective, these issues that I'm marking up from the actual Navis file, they can be added between meetings at any given time that you have to make an issue. 
as soon as you make an issue, the entire team gets it instantaneously. So it's automatically emailed to you. You get a notification when you launch the program and you launch the issue tracker. Your log is automatically updated to say, oh, look, I have three new issues that he found. I can fix them before the meeting gets there. So instead of waiting to the next meeting and a coordinator found a couple of extra things that he didn't point out during the meeting, you now have, you now have the opportunity to, to fix those in the meeting. So some, those are some of the cool things. But let me show you something else that I think that everybody it just loves, and that's this. So this is the, the, the aha moment for me if I was looking at this from both a GC's perspective and also from a subcontractor or designer's perspective, and that gets back to where is that issue at? You know, in Navisworks, what I can do is I make a viewpoint. I kind of, not, I kind of know where it is. But this guy has just went through and identified and given me a couple hundred issues to fix. I really don't know where that's at. And I'm going to spend a lot of time just going through and figuring this out on my own. I, I took good notes. Let me see if I know where that's at. The, the switchback that, that we had with Navisworks really never worked. And when it did work, it only really worked for AutoCAD users. So we really didn't know where it was. So I'm just show you how this works right now real quick. So you can see in the model here, this is my Navisworks model. I've, I've driven to a different location. Um, but over here, if I go back to my issue tracker, this is the issue that I want to look at. I'm looking at this on the screen. I just want to confirm that this has been picked up from a coordinator's perspective. Instead of trying to locate this, I can do one of two things. I can click on the 3D button here, which will launch the actual 3D model, and the Revisto app, which is awesome. In fact, I'm finding myself using that now more than I am with Navisworks because the graphics is just a little bit better. Um, but even better is this fact that the issue tracker is now the common speak and common denominator and holds the coordinates for you as a modeler. You can double-click on this element. In this issue, see when it's blue right now, if you just double click on it and you go back to your Navisworks session, there it is. That's the very element that I was talking about. So what you can do, and this is this makes things you know so much better. I, I now have been identified, I've told you, or I've, I've been, we've given you guys ideas for making the solution. You now know exactly where it is and in the total awesomeness, this is why I get so excited. I showed one of my subcontractors the other day on a new project. He was, he's, he's using Revit and he's modeling in Revit. Instead of driving any, instead of just driving the Navisworks file, he can launch that issue tracker from Revit, from AutoCAD with DesignFab in there, double tapping on it, and it's automatically putting an isometric view, zoomed in on that very object he needs to fix. So he no, again, he no longer has to guess where it is. The other cool thing is with these issues that I got in here and I got these filtered, I didn't even think about this until somebody brought this up the other day, is now I have a project that has several hundred issues. I can then search by whatever issue this is. I can search by 215. I can up here in this little search box. I can click on that to load it in the window. And then, again, I can double click on it there. Go into Navisworks, boom. That's exactly where it is. I no longer have to guess in Navisworks or Revit or AutoCAD what element to fix. I have that dynamic link automatically in the X, Y, and Z to, to, to basically line the screenshot of what we found during that issue tracker. Now we want to talk about some of the challenges after we get done going through some of these awesome features that we have, but I, 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 really, I really want to focus on the fact that what we've noticed from both a GC's perspective and a subcontractor's perspective trying to collect or trying to clean up his, his issues or come up with his solutions, we can now have a common denominator and a common speak. And again, this is live. So if I was in here right now and this was a live project and, and Mark was on this, Mark could be adding comments to my view and you would see those get added when I was in here currently at the moment. So let's go back and see what else we wanted to talk about today. I got maybe a little yeah, more. that's it. I think that's a good point, Jim, is, is is that that entire issue tracker is live and updated. So that's sitting on top of the entire model, whether it's AutoCAD, Revit, Navisworks. It's not tied to the actual file. It's tied to the coordinate location, as Jim said, that sits above the model. So it's almost like another dimension to BIM. And, right. uh, and, I def <clears throat> and as Jim said as well, after he gets to this next slide, I want to walk through some of the challenges and stuff that Jim had with implementation or other firms that we've seen. We don't, you know, we don't, uh, 
we don't we're not saying Revisto is 100% perfect. No product is. So we want to be as we always are 100% realistic with some of the you know challenges that people have faced, whether it's getting consultants onboarded or you're getting trades into the into utilizing a new platform and some of those struggles and, and how you know some some tactics to overcome that. So um, Jim, I'll give it back to you on the next slide here. So what you can see, and, and Mark sent me this this cool slide. This kind of I think this kind of focuses on what we just talked about. This is basically the workflow that we have with Revisto and, and how it actually works. And like Mark said, the issue tracker is sitting on top of, in a separate space, on top of, you know, outside your modeling applications, outside your coordinations, but it's tethered to all of those. And it's live. So, again, if anybody wants to change the status from, and this is the other cool thing that I, I, I didn't really show, but this is what people were doing. And I don't, I don't know if I have an example that I can quickly find because we have a lot of clashes that are on here. There are a lot of uh, issues that we are tracking. But what happens is, let's say we had, this was an issue that was assigned to mechanical pipe. And he's in, and he's in here and he's, he's made his solution. But accidentally, I've changed, or I've, I've, I've assigned this issue to him. And then again, typically in coordination, we'll assign that during coordination. But let's say he makes a move that affects somebody else. What we typically do on our end is what he'll do is, is why it would come in here and then once he's solved, if it's got to be assigned to somebody else on the team, he would basically reassign it to somebody else that's there and then they would get an instant notification on something that they need to fix. So it was, it was really cool in that we saw what we had always asked people to do because, and again, we're just creatures of habit. We're trying to trying to be most efficient with our time and we're typically working on three or four projects at the same time and a lot of times we just don't have time to pick up the phone believe it or not or email and get outside what we're trying to do because we're in this mindset of correcting all of our issues well now we've given our sub our, our partners the ability to reassign it to somebody else and it's in these this communication is happening outside our normal meetings and again it, it, it can't I can't express to you how much of a, of, a, of a difference that is. And we'll talk about metrics again at the end. But this, this medium that, that lies on top of all these, which is live, and again, any change that happens, it goes out to the entire team. If we update the, we update the models, uh, we, there's a video on 4.3 that shows how we can use the exporter to sync up our models on a, on a daily or bi-daily basis, or if it's you know, however often you want to sync those up. You want to give the partners the ability to put their models up there. As soon as the change is pushed up to the actual service, when you log on as a user, you no longer have to download those latest files. They're already automatically synced up automatically for you every time you log on, which is just awesome. So, again, where did we begin on our end? And, again, I think we kind of looked at this issue tracker. What we pre pretty much did is we kind of went through, I kind of went through that already, I think I'm out of sequence here, but what we did as a, as a group is had to figure out how we're going to tackle this. And our, big, our biggest issue was, you know, the initially we get an issue like this, this is the one thing that I didn't understand when I was first using the application. This is what I first thought was better with Navisworks, and now I'm finding that this, this process is working even better than I thought it was working with Navisworks initially, if that makes sense. So initially, um, when I'm looking at the issue tracker in here, if I don't go to the 3D view, um, I can only see what the static issue was up here. So what we, again, this is just something that we developed. But basically what we're asking our, our, our partners to do is anytime something's been solved, mark a solved solution, and then I can come in here and look at it here, or I can come in here and I can load the 3D. This is actually inside uh, Revisto right now. I can actually look at the 3D, um, but I can actually see what that is. So that was just kind of a mindset for us, and you know, I didn't even realize this, but typically what we were doing is, um, and this is a new feature with 4.3, the one thing that you can do, and I don't know if you guys have experienced this or not, but let's say we have an issue that's on here. Um, how do I go there? I can do print screen. I don't know if this will work. Uh, issue tracker, and then oh, you know, I'm I'm probably not going to work so hot in here. Um, but basically, now instead of inserting an image, we can actually 
put and copy the print screen right on here and crop it and add that right to right to the actual chat log. So inside the chat log, we actually have a live um, link of everything that has happened with that element. And, and I think that was one of the key processes that we had to figure out as a team. And what we were doing was we were basically, um, before we were actually live clipping things inside from um, the issue tracker, uh, we were actually uh, saving uh, images out via the clipping tool and we would save them with the ID number and then like 001, 002, et cetera. Um, so we would have both the ID number along with what version of that ID number that we've been correcting. And, and so far, it's been flawless. I mean, we're, there's, there's always constant improvement, and we're going to be switching, switching over now that we can actually do the, the uh, print copy or print screen and copy, which I'll, uh, I think you'll see in the video. Um, but that was one of, the, one of the things that we had to do as a, as a, as a team. And then the other thing we that's had to yeah, the, go ahead. I was going to say that's really cool, Jim, because what you're doing is not having to download and load that 3D model. So if you're on a lighter piece of hardware, or you're on an iPad, people can see that it's been addressed without selecting 3D and actually launching the entire 3D application. So and, and that's, that's a what, really unique workflow. And that it's kind of what we want to do because you know the the one issue that we had to. The one issue that I struggled with was, again, again, because we're just so used to when we clicked on Navisworks, when we clicked on that view, if we had downloaded the, the files or we were working on it by ourselves, um, we would just we would load our new file in there and switch to the viewpoint and we could see it corrected. Um, so, yeah, by copying that screenshot, it, it, like you said, it made it really, it, it communicated to the team instantaneously and it made it really light. So rather, you know, even though we're, we're running our exporter and we're syncing up our files on a daily basis, you know, before we even got that updated 3D model in the actual Revista, we could actually see what was happening with the team. And that, and that boils down to the other thing that we had to learn as a process is how often do you sync up? And this is one thing that we, we kind of stress, you know, at our kickoff meetings when every single project that we have going on is the one thing that we talked about was, you know, you always have to post your your files, you know, you know, the day before the meeting, right? Everybody says that. But what what is reality, or what was reality? I should say, reality was well, we'd get to the coordination and we would get files like five minutes before a meeting. Well, what we're finding out now, now that everybody's using the issue tracker, and I told people, I said, you know what? It's going to be as good as as you want to make it. So if you want to post, I I would I would use Box Sync and sync your files up there on a daily basis. And then we'll sync them up to the we'll sync them up through the exporter and have you a live model every day. But that means that you got to push it out there. And believe it or not, people bought into that right away because they were getting they were getting closer up to date models than what they ever were. And it really doesn't take any time to push the files out there. So it was this one of the things that we're kind of pushing now is 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 telling people that in, instead of posting you know before the meetings now just as a routine just post your file up to the cloud or the FTP site every day, and it's been working out great. So why was it so impactful? As you can see, um, some of the, we can track the issues. It, it, you know, hence the name, issue tracker. We can track the issues. We can sort the issues. We can see where something is. Um, we can assign new issues, like I said, outside the meetings. We no longer, as a coordinator, I can assign new issues that I've found with the, the new design that the people are constantly working on. I can find and address new issues outside the meetings. What does that do? Well, again, it, it, the fact that, and this is the other the cool thing, which we, I think I talk about later, is the fact that it works across all the platforms. I can be sitting on my iPad, like Mark said. I can be on my tablet, which is awesome. It's one of the only applications that truly works with a tablet with the jog feature. Um, so you can be sitting on your tablet, making new issues, reviewing models in your, in your time that you have. But, as soon as you, as a coordinator, make a new issue, it's live. Again, it's sitting on top of the of everything else. So they're constantly getting uh, resolution and new issues on the fly. And how awesome is the fact that you exactly know where your issue is? I showed this to people and subs that are are, are they they came from like a foreman background and they 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 found that the software was extremely easy to use. But the fact that he could actually double tip them, double click on that, and no longer had to go through a plan, cut a section, find out where his issue was, he could just double click on it and knew exactly what to fix. He's like, total game changer. Drop the mic on my ass right there. It was awesome. 
Um, and then again, the seamless communication. That's what this is all about. You know, I, I preach. I I preach to this to the students that I teach at the at the college. Is the whole mindset of BIM and VDC is it's 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 collaborating in a virtual environment and just communicating to everybody that's involved. Right? It's a better way to communicate. And it wasn't always a better way to communicate because like we were saying, what we would do is we would run clash detection, we would copy screenshots, shoot emails, and you had to hop through three or four hoops at the same time to get a result where all you really wanted to do was go in there and fix it, say, all right, I'm done. I think, I think so-and-so's got to move. I want to go on to my next issue and fix it. Well, now you can. Now you go in there, you look at your issue, you mark it resolved, you copy a screenshot. If it has to be assigned to somebody else, you do it right in the same platform, and ding, he gets an email and says, oh, yeah, i got to fix this. That's cool. I'll fix that before my next meeting. It's been incredible. So, um, again, we can re re reassign the, 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 uh, the issues. Um, we've got a log of everything that's happened. And again, this is something else I wanted to showcase. Um, we talk a little bit about this, and you've seen some of the webinars that uh, Mark and the team have put on um, linking the two to three D. You know, so sometimes, um, you know, as a uh, as a coordinator, you're probably like the geek of everybody else, right? Or a subcontract, or you're the you're the modeler. You're the geek in the office. You're running this 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 cool technology, and anytime they have something in three D, they always come to you. Right, a lot of our our PMs and a lot of um, everybody, a lot of the other staff that's involved, they still like the 2D medium. Well, how cool is it to link the actual 2D plans to the actual working coordination model, and they can actually navigate in that? I've I've showed it to people that really are not are really not uh, 3D savvy. They can they can operate in the 2D thing. What I'm going to show you real quick again. So. Kind of adding on to some of the thing, other things that we saw that were on here. Um, again, it works across all the platforms, which I think everybody has witnessed, and that's what drew me to that. That's what drew me to the team three years ago when I first started. It drew me to them like instantaneously. They were on the cutting edge of using a game engine that worked across all the platforms. That's all I really wanted. Well, this one truly does that. It works on your iPad. It works on your Android. It works on your tablet with the jog control. We didn't have an application for uh, Navisworks or even Glue, you know, a couple years ago when it first came out. I don't know if it's changed now, but to use those applications, you still have to plug in your tablet, have a separate mouse, and use that to drive around in the model. How frustrating was that to have cutting-edge technology, but we didn't have software that allow you to view your model or view the issues? These guys have had it. They have instant VR. We can talk a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about this later, but not a whole lot because I think I'm going to run out of time. But the this is the new phase. It's what it's going across our industry as a as a team. Um, you now use your models uh, for coordination. You publish them to Revisto. Automatically, you have instant VR for the Oculus for the Vibe. Um, and what I found when I was teaching this in my class, uh, which just wrapped up last week. I, they now have it worked out with, uh, I think it was two versions ago, Mark, you said you fixed this, but the Oculus Touch, incredible. I, I, I have people that it was just like you would watch in, on TV or in commercials. I was, they weren't extremely tech savvy. I could show them how to use the Oculus Touch with the little joystick controllers with the thumbs. They were walking through the entire, and they were walking through the entire model and they felt like they were there. Um, they didn't want to take it off, and, and they gave them the opportunity to look at it after I gave them their final exam. And uh, I had people sticking around for another hour just walking through the models, viewing this. And if you haven't tested it out yet, I would highly recommend that you test that out. Um, I think the graphics are better. Let me show you something here, and I, this is just mind blowing. I didn't even see this, and I give I give my uh, I give everybody a little bit of stuff or a little bit of grief here. Let's see, because uh, they put uh, it's funny people in uh, coordination they'll add stuff. To our projects. Let's see. I gotta do this by me. Signy. Do it by Jim. General question. No. Uh, I'm looking for Affleck. Here it is. Let's see if I can. I gotta probably go out and 
it doesn't, sometimes you have to go out of the model and turn off. Oh, I think I know what it is. I think the suctioning does it. If you turn this off, maybe not. Cancel, go back home. Oh, here it is. Look at this. So I was, I was just, one night I was looking at the model, but how awesome is this? I mean, totally. You know what this is? This is a, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, I forget what they call it, but there's a, there's a map that has that, uh, it's a, it's a I'm, I'm, my mind is losing the, the term, but there's a, there's a procedural map that they have applied to the actual water element that comes in here by default. And the water is actually flowing. The colors from the paint that the that our design team has put on here is actually painted on the walls. So when you're walking through this in the VR, it's awesome. I mean, you feel like you're there. And, and this is just the start. And from from us, we're actually changing the way in which we are now assigning colors. We're bringing in FBXs um, and really baking the stuff onto the baking the stuff onto the model. So, again, in my opinion, I think the graphics is like a thousand times better. And if you have this, the other cool, super cool thing about the technology is because it's basically built on a game, a true game engine, if you have a machine that has like a high-end uh, gamer's car, like a 1080 um, or anything higher, there's pretty much nothing you cannot do with the software. It just eats it up. So... Um, those are some of the cool things that we've noticed. And again, I, I just love it because um, in, in, in addition to the better graphics, if you're using this on multiple platforms, they give you the, the reason it works on multiple platforms is you can set the graphics that you want to put on that platform. So if you have a tablet that only has 8 gigs of RAM, you just set the graphic, the graphic resolution on the on the tablet, and it works through. and And I had it on a, I had it on my little Sony Duo that only had eight gigs of RAM, and it was still showing the the the, the, water, the water map, all that stuff. It might have been walking a little bit slower, but it was walking through just fine. Um, let's go through the T, the two D, and how that actually works with the entire team. And I think if most of you guys have seen this, this is something that we've initiated. And I don't know that I have it on this particular project. And I was telling Mark, I don't know how we can launch multiple projects during this presentation. But a lot of people were asking the question um, with, with Revista, what do you do about grids? Well, one of the things you could do if you thought outside the box is you could create a separate sheet that had nothing but your grids on it and superimpose that. And you can drop that dot down inside the model. So let's, let's just go to a, a 2D plan here real quick. And you do that, if, for those of you that are new that are seeing this for the first time, what you do is you basically click on the 2D tab, and there's a little, there's a little icon up here that will list all the drawings. But any drawing that has been printed from directly from, from Revit that's been linked will automatically have this green button. Otherwise, you can manually set 2D sheets that, are, that you get from PDFs or sketches or what have you. You can, you can put something, as long as you can scan it in and it's electronic, you can pin that you can pin that sheet in perspective, and this is what's cool. So you can click on the little green button here, and all of a sudden, what it does is it overlays this. My computer is going to run a little slow because I think everybody's on here, and I got the setup as a vector. But you can see what it's doing is it's basically linking that sheet in the actual location. So when it redraws, what I'm finding that I typically do is if I'm modeling something for a site. For, for site uh, logistics or what have you, typically I'm, I'm making revision clouds on uh, revision clouds on something I needed to fix. You can load those right into the sheet, and you can you can attach issues to that. So you can look at your issue tracker on 2D or 3D. You can do goof. You can do silly things like detaching the sheet. So if I can pin that sheet in one location, and I can drag the I can drag the uh, the model up or down in section, and this is what we're doing with grids. So you could create a separate sheet that just had your grid lines on there, pin it to a certain location, and then get that. See, so you know that's the actual view that I want to start when I'm starting to review these. I can come in here then and make a, a viewpoint for this. And let's go test. And now when I flip between views, this is with the underground. I come back to the test view. There it is. It loaded my grids or my plan right in that actual view. And that's the other thing. I don't know that you guys have ever realized this, but now we were testing this out um, the other day, is the way in which the program makes its viewpoints in this actual program 
or inside Revisto is whatever whatever section you have cut, it remembers, just like Navisworks. Whatever you there was a checkbox inside Navisworks where whenever an element was hidden or on you know if you hid something and then made a viewpoint, it would hide it in either all the views or you could uncheck it and do a view by view. Um, Revisto does the same thing. If I hide something in one view and make a view, I go to the next view, it can be completely unhidden. I can make another view, which is awesome. So you could do phasing. Um, you can maybe set up views for doing uh, site safety walks for your foreman's meeting. You can add like construction fencing, your cranes. You can have those turned on for only certain views. And I think we're going to find that even, even more beneficial when Mark is going to maybe talk about some of the features with 4.4, but one of the things that's coming up with 4.4 that I'm most excited about was this is one of the challenges we had as a, as a team was having the ability to turn on and off certain elements. So if I exported this, this project from Navisworks, you know, the way it used to work is I didn't have control because they were, it was a pipe, it, let's say it was something from design, uh, uh, pipe fab or something. I couldn't. I couldn't turn it off because there was basically an extra casing or shell around it. I had no way to do that. So what we, what I can show you the workflow that we came up with that seemed to work. Um, but with four four, you're going to be able to turn on and off individual pieces with uh, your Navisworks export, so you no longer have to jump through these hoops. Now some of the things like we're doing with grids and sections and views and comments, I think you probably want to continue on with those because I think it's beneficial. Um, but again, it's just a different mindset and things that we've come up with. Um, so let me go back to what else we have on the list here, so I can hop through. And, these and Jim, I know we got we got about uh, eight minutes left here, so um, so maybe run through this, and we'll kind of open it up for for questions. So I'm yeah. sure they're still. Yeah. So let me just. Uh, this is something else I was asked um, recently. Let me just. Uh, in fact, I think the only way for me to do this is reporting. How, how many of you guys have used reporting? Um, uh, what I use reporting feature for is, let's say somebody uh, is in a is in a coordination, but they're not, you know, the, for some reason the issues aren't getting resolved. We now have the ability to generate reports based on your IDs, and this is where the tags come in. Super important. The more the the tags that you can identify, you can run reports on those tags or by assignee, and you can filter that down uh, per the element. And let me just get out of this because I think the only way I can do this is show you, which I don't know that I have it on the screen here. Well, one second. Uh, reports. So this is a report that uh, we did on a project recently. So I was able to come in here and you basically run the report. You can export it and have it email it directly to you. And it puts it in an Excel file. And what you can do is you can click on the actual snapshot. It actually basically loads and keeps in memory the issue from the log which is awesome because it's this really small Excel file that you can send out an email to the entire team uh, right away. So that was one thing that I thought was really cool. Um, and then uh, I think that's, I mean, we I talked about the VR already. I want to hit on this and then I'll, I'll turn, I think I'll open it up to questions. So this is what we're finding out from this new process. This is, this is not me, this is feedback that I'm getting from my subs uh, or my design partners. It's so much easier to use. I don't know how I ever used Navisworks without it. Um, I couldn't have finished this project without it. That one project that we had, you know, thousands of issues. There was no way without the issue tracker to sort it by that user to fix his issues. There was no way we were ever going to get it done. The bottom line is, though, because now people are communicating in this medium, we're finding that it's 25 to 40 percent faster than typical coordination. Oh, I mean, that is just mind-boggling to me. And, and why? It's because you know, people are communicating again. We, we have the medium now to communicate with one another and the team, and we have the ability to dynamically link because it's in that other layer to the actual modeling platform. That Those two things, I think, are truly the reason that um, we are seeing all these efficiencies. And I, I think the more people use it, the, the more things we're going to find out as, as the year goes along. Um, but those are just some of the things that uh, we've noticed. And I think we'll open it up to questions at this point. Does that sound good, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, Jim, for your, your time and, and taking some, some time out of your day to kind of walk through the actual process that you guys are using. And for anybody that has questions, if you guys want to type them into the box, uh, we have 
be happy to pass those on to on to Jim. Um, so uh, had a couple questions. I know somebody already asked. Uh, they didn't. They're looking for where the pin was on the plan to overlay. Um, that's pretty simple. Um, I can actually uh, show my screen, or Jim can show your, his screen and show you where that is. Um, it's underneath the 2D button. Um, on every single plan detail elevation that comes from Revit, there's an automatic section box, a uh, little green section cut button. And that just says that you know there's coordinates tied into that. So you can see those little green buttons. So any of these plans that, that Jim will click should have a green bu button there. That's just saying that those plans have came from Revit and they have you know coordinate locations tied to them. If you import a PDF, you can manually tag that PDF to the correct location and assign it coordinates. It's pretty simple to do, and we have some YouTube videos on step-by-step -step process for that. Um, so, uh, Jim, one of the questions is, is, was how early in the project do you start using Revisto? Did you start it in SDs or DDs? Um, we are starting. Um, you know, I. It's just. It's this because it's a communication background. I. I'm seeing. You know, we're we're starting this. You know, right is is the sooner you can do this, the better off you are, right? Um, so we are seeing this in SD actually, and we're using it. We're using it outside that as well to do things like again, even before we got to that point. Let's say you're trying to use this to do site logistics as a team. You can now effortless, effortless, effortlessly communicate with your team members on a project just marking up site logistics. So. You can do all this stuff before even going to presentation. You can use it for presentations, you can use it for coordination, but yeah, the earlier the better. And uh, Taylor was asking, what was your deployment strategy in regards to, did you start, did you target one specific project to start off, tested this out, did you roll this out on multiple projects? How did you kind of define that, you know, role in, of, of each individual project? Yeah, and that's a good question, and that's one thing that, um, uh, Taylor, what we did is we, we actually we I, I just like everything else, I kind of instead of taking this on a huge project, which would be a extreme no no, I we picked a we picked a, a project that was decent inside, complex enough, but it was one particular project that we started it out on, and we tested that out for a period of a couple months, and then I rolled it out on a little bit larger project, and then I think I, I test based it test based it on. Um, three key projects, and then I, we're rolling it out company wide to the entire team uh, as we speak right now. So, so every project that we have inside our house is uh, actually rolling out the software on new projects. So I know we're kind of at our limit. Um, there's a, a couple other questions on here that we'll try to answer in the chat box that are coming in here. Uh, we'll answer one more, and then. I wanted to spend maybe two minutes going over some of the challenges with coordinates. I know that's right at 2 o'clock, so this is being recorded, so we'll send that out for those of you guys that have to jump off. Uh, the question, the last question we're going to answer today is, have you used grouping in Navisworks? Why are you not using boxes during coordination to exchange data? Why, why the FTP? Um, oh, we are using box. And we are okay. using a box to exchange data, and yes, we are doing grouping. but. Um, a lot of uh, even though you're doing box and you're 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 sharing your files up there, you're still um, you're still really only posting your files. You're really not you're really not communicating. All you're doing, from what I could see when we were doing that, is you know we were we were putting stuff up there, but you still you lacked communication. And and it was the communication that we saw, and and you know when something was resolved, if they closed it out, I just it's. It, it, it's mind-blowing how much that spoke to the issues that you were addressing. Um, as a coordinator and as a modeler, you knew exactly what was happening before it actually happened. So that's, that's kind of what we were doing. So yes, we are using Box, um, actually using Box Sync on a lot of our projects, and that's how we're using the exporter, which if you guys got time at the end, Mark's got a little video on 4.3, shows you how the exporter works, and you can actually uh, schedule that and, and push it out there as much as you want. Okay, and then I guess the last thing, and I know we're right at right at uh, two o'clock here Central Time, but I wanted to address one of the challenges. I think we get a lot of questions on, and uh, and that's around the the coordinate systems. What if you know trades are in AutoCAD and they're modeling at zero zero or a goofy coordinate system? Right. Uh, you know, how have you you know that's been a challenge that you 
had to work around as well as some other of our, our customers. What, uh, what, what's kind of been your workaround or take on that, Jim? Yeah, and, and, and see, that is one of the hiccups that, uh, or one of, I wouldn't say hiccups, one of the struggles that we've had is um, the way in which the issue tracker works on and doing the dynamic link back to the modeling application is it tries to basically take that camera view and that camera angle and mimic it in your in your in the software that you have the issue tracker launched from. So if you're not in the exact same X, Y, and Z, then um, you'll be in in typically people will model at Z at zero, but they they weren't able to actually see the element when they were doing that. So what we found is anybody that modeled in the true X, Y, and Z, we we never had any issues. And the way in which we do our process holistically is. We typically, everybody is always modeled in X and Y. Um, up until recently, we always gave them the opportunity to, to model at zero. And, and we still give them the opportunity to model at zero, but now we're telling them and showing them the benefit. If they model at true Z, they can actually use this software or other softwares. Uh, it's, we, have the similar, we have the same issue when we're doing uh, scheduling or facility management software, all that stuff. A lot, of, a lot of that software does not use shared coordinates, so you want to be at the true X, Y, and Z so that that grid system that you're using as a team as part of your, your BIM execution plan um, should probably be adjusted to be, you, you got to hammer home that you want to model it true Z. And the other, the other reason I like that is as a modeler myself, if I'm, if I'm grabbing somebody else's file from Box or from FTP or wherever you're grabbing your, your, your files from, you want to be able to insert those files in your application so that you can use those instantaneously. So uh, we're just kind of hammering that home right now where they gotta, they gotta, if they want to take full benefit of the program, they should be modeling in Z. And, and now that people are seeing it, they're really not giving any, 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 any pushback on that either. To answer your question? Yes, I think it. I think you did. I think you covered that one. And uh, yeah, so the last thing I'll do here before we wrap this up, for those of you guys that have stuck around, I know Jim mentioned 4.4 a lot. Just give you a real quick um, overview of, of what 4.4 will have is is the color coding ability and be able to isolate individual objects. So if you guys can see my screen right now. Um, which I believe you guys, yep, you guys can. So you'll see that we have phases that come in there. We can color code each individual phase, or we can break out and actually color code um, the different uh, disciplines or linked files. So being able to come into here and, and see um, the different things that we can color code and, and utilize this to override things in the appearance profile or, or filters, uh, colors that you might have filtered in Revit. So it's nice to be able to come into here. We can assign a color. And we can coordinate, you know, those different colors within Revisto. Um, also, along with that is being able to isolate those individual objects and being able to see things within the linked file, and then again phases. So I don't want to give it give it all away. I'm sure you guys are all excited to test it out uh, when this comes out in a couple weeks. So we're excited for you guys to be able to to run through this and see all the different um, aspects of of the new filtering aspect and, and seeing these link files and whatnot within uh, Revisto for coordination. So uh, just a quick preview of what 4.4 is going to look like and we're excited to get your, your hands on it. So with that being said, I want to thank Jim again and uh, thank everybody for their time. I know we went uh, a couple minutes over and, and uh, this has been recorded so we'll send it out to everybody on the team and you guys will be able to uh, pass it on to anybody else. So hopefully this was beneficial and certainly provide us any feedback for things that you'd like us to address on our next global webinar or uh, possible topics that you want us to, dis to discuss in some of our training sessions. So thanks again, Jim, and thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, guys.